Okay, thanks for reminding me. Okay, so, so sometimes uh, when you do exploratory data analysis using uh, principal component analysis, um, if you have already labeled data, yeah, yeah, your data has the class label, then um, you may actually get better results if you use the information from the label. Um, usually PCA is considered a kind of like a, when you have label information, you can choose to use PCA anyway because uh, you could think of it as a kind of like more, um, uh, it's kind of like a more conservative method whereby you, you may actually want to see like even without using label information, whether the, the structure itself is apparent right, from the data. So it could actually be, sometimes people use PCA even though they have label information because they want some kind of a confirmation, yeah? They want to kind of like confirm that, yes, um, there is a structure in the um, PCA space and that structure actually is associated with the label information, right? And that gives them confidence that their label information uh, is, is uh, reliable, right? And sometimes people might want to do that. Um, but sometimes um, on some other situations, if you already have very uh, uh, good evidence that your, your label information is reliable, then uh, you might as well just use, the, use that information uh, when you try to do dimensional reduction, right? And uh, linear discriminant analysis helps you do this. Um, if you have watched the video that I posted uh, about uh, the short, short video about uh, linear discriminant analysis, then you know that uh, basically linear discriminant analysis and uh, PCA, they, um, they differ, all right, by the, the rotation, right? The kind of rotation that is actually done to the data. Okay, so um, just to recap, so in, if you have some data that is like this, sometimes your PCA and your LDA will lead to same results. Right? Let's say you have labeled data that's like this. Okay, so the, if you look at the axis that has the largest variation. That axis is here, right? Because along this axis, uh, your variance is the largest here, okay? Then uh, it constructs an orthogonal axis. It's 90 degrees to this, and then you make a rotation, right? So then after you, this is your uh, PCA. So after you do the rotation, so you get your data here. All right. All right, so you get your data here and you, without using the label information, you already can see that there are clusters here, right? So that's fine. Um, but sometimes, sometimes uh, you may not be able to get this kind of result by using PCA. Now, if you look at, for the same data, right, we are going to look at uh, a kind of, uh, so what axis would LDA give you? So, so if you do PCA, it will give you this, this axis, okay? So for LDA, which axis would it find? So, oh, did somebody draw an axis over there? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, you drew it. Yes. Uh, is it here? Yeah, I think it's that, I'm not so sure. 
Uh, no, I don't think so. If you have this axis, right, you have to you will make a projection onto the. So so if you have an axis like this, your projections will fall on. For the plus, they will fall on here, and the others will fall on here as well. So it won't work. So, so the axis, the I think, is the same in this case as PCA. So your axis will be the same. Oops. So so. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe uh, shift it a little bit. You can see that with this axis. You make projections, they're all falling here. So the distribution of the data is has this distribution here for the plus, and this is the distribution for the uh, circle. Um, so along this axis, your between uh, uh, your between uh, population sum of square is actually larger than your within population sum of squares. All right. So, so your LDA basically finds the rotation that maximizes the uh, uh, between some square over within some square uh, criterion. And this one in matrix notation uh, is actually trying to uh, maximize, I think this um, inverse WSB. Okay, you have to check the video again. So this this matrix, right, is a square matrix, and um, this is the sum square matrix for uh, between group variation, and this is a um, square. So this is the sum square matrix for the within group variation, right? And this inverse actually uh, plays the role of um, so you look at this in if in the univariate case you have this case yeah, uh, VSS over WSS. Uh, in matrix notation you will have VSS replaced by the matrix for between group, and the uh, division here is indicated by you cannot divide a matrix in linear algebra, but you can multiply the inverse. So it has an analog that is. Uh, uh, and inverse here. So for this, so this square matrix encapsulates this uh, uh, between group variation to within group variation. Yeah. So so um, then then after that, uh, you basically just do eigen decomposition on um, eigen decomposition on this this uh, matrix. All right. Uh, which allows you to find the eigenvectors. So the, the, the linear discriminant analysis also has loadings. All right, and um, so those loadings are found from the eigenvectors uh, of uh, this eigen decomposition exercise, okay. Uh, So one main difference uh, and another difference is that in your LDA, you have the number of uh, LD axis is uh, equal to the following. It's the smaller of these two values. Okay, this P is the number of variables and the C is the number of classes. Okay, so uh, unlike principal component analysis, principal component analysis, uh, the number of principal component axis is equal to P, right? The number of variables. Whereas in this case, uh, if, if you have, uh, let's say binary case, right? Binary uh, classes, then you will have only one linear discriminant uh, axis. Okay, so the, the compression that it actually achieves is uh, a lot, yeah, with linear discriminant analysis. Okay, so 
for the particular example uh, where uh, certain kind of rotations result in uh, better discrimination of the uh, uh, classes, you can uh, watch the video uh, again. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to give you a demonstration of um, how L, uh, using linear discriminant analysis can, some, can Im make improvements to your principal component analysis when you're trying to detect uh, clusters in low dimensional space. So I'm going to, so uh, I've already put up the script. Um, you, can, you can run the script later on your own, all right? So the data set that is used is the uh, glass data set, okay? Which I think uh, was used in the presentation. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Can you see my uh, console? My R console? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, okay. So I have... Um, Well, it probably doesn't work. Um, well, it does. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, okay, let me run this again. Okay, so uh, so you you can check the R code later for data processing. Yeah, um, since this is a compositional data, you have to process it um, using the centered log ratio, um, which brings the compositional data to the usual Euclidean space. Um, now I want to show you the result of the PCA. So, all right, can you see the plot? Yes. Okay, so, so this is, these are the uh, pairwise scatter plots um, for the uh, glass data. As you can see, um, there is some evidence of uh, clustering for the magenta data points, right? Um, but otherwise, they they are not that clear, actually. All right. Um, okay. So so just maybe slight evidence for the magenta. Okay. Uh, maybe a little bit for the part of the yellow, so the orange ones, right? So, so if you, well, okay, so, so it doesn't give you much except that you know that some of the magenta, maybe they form a cluster. So now I make use of, uh, uh, 
linear discriminant analysis, all right? Wait, I think something is wrong. Okay, okay, got it back. All right, okay, so this is the linear discriminant analysis uh, pairwise scatter plots. As you can see, I have, um, I've got six types, yeah? Uh, six types of, um, Uh, class labels, and I think I have more than six uh, variables. All right, so that's why the number of linear discriminant axes are, uh, sorry, is equal to five, yeah, six minus one. And you can see from here, um, LD1, LD2, you already can see that there are, there's uh, quite good evidence of clustering for the magenta, and also the blue. Okay, if you, I think uh, mostly for these two, um, yeah, I think basically it makes a small improvement, all right, where uh, previously you cannot see six very clearly, but now you can see six um, more clearly, all right. So, uh, but usually you may actually want to focus on one of the plots here. So, um, in order to do so, you have to um, do something like this. All right. So, once you have run, Hey, uh, are you still seeing my console? Yes. Okay. Okay, so once you have uh, run LDA, you will see some, uh, if you store it in an object called model, you will see some, some uh, information like this. So uh, it gives you the group means for each of the variables, right? And then they give you the uh, loadings for the, in each uh, of the linear discriminants. So you are showing the enlarge R console, is it? It's a bit confusing now with my console. Let, let, me, let me check this again. Uh, no, I, I'm not sure. Okay. I think I showed the wrong one. Okay. Uh, yeah, now we, we see that. Yeah, it should be this one. I showed the, the code. Okay, so you can see the, um, so you have the linear discriminants, all right? And, and the variables, yeah, the variables here are the chemical uh, constituents and there's a physical variable, uh, refractive index. So the data has been scaled so that uh, it is the same as um, when you do the PCA, yeah? when you do PCA, um, I use the correlation matrix uh, for eigen decomposition. So, so that's equivalent to scaling the data, right? So therefore, uh, before I run this, I, already, I also scaled the data. And you can see here, so here it tells you that your linear discriminant one is uh, influenced by which um, variable more, all right? So, uh, here it's mainly uh, sodium, right? Sodium, then strong, mo moving to the right hand side, right? Sodium. You can see the barium, right? I think uh, during the presentation, I think the, the group found barium, right? So you can also see it here. All right? So barium and aluminum, these two things, they move 
um, the data points to the right hand side, all right, along with uh, sodium. And LD2, uh, you can check. So, so the details for LD2, you can check here, right? So you can see the proportion of trace. These are the amount of uh, total variation that's explained by the linear discriminant axis, right? So it's the same. It's uh, basically taking the eigenvalue and you divide it by the sum of the eigenvalues, right? It, <clears throat> so over here, so these are your loadings, right? So you want to, if you want to recover the scores, now the uh, one, I think one problem is that in, in, when you run LDA, it does not give you the uh, linear discriminant scores actually in the output, right? You, you cannot uh, recover it from this, uh, function, I think. So, but then that is not a problem. Um, if you can just use uh, your basic linear algebra uh, knowledge to recover the scores. So basically you just multiply. So these are just the eigenvectors, right? Your LD1. So this gives you all the eigenvectors. You basically just multiply the eigenvector with the data vector and that's it. All right. So, so let me see your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you've got you've got nine, um, nine uh, variables here. So let me show you how you can compute this. Okay. So you can see here. Um, let me check. Um, let me show you the dimension of x and the structure of x, right? So your data x here consists of the centered log ratio transform um, uh, values, ri, and also the class, right? Type. Okay. So you, when you want to recover the uh, LD scores, you don't use type, right? Because type is just a class label. So basically you have uh, this X matrix has two, one, four rows and nine columns. All right. And your linear discriminant, um, okay. So then your, this one is your linear discriminant uh, that you want to get. So you can see here, yeah, I put as matrix X without the last column, which means uh, it, it, it removes this uh, type, yeah? So that matrix will have dimension uh, 214 times nine, all right? Okay, and this, symbol here, the percent, uh, asterisk percent is matrix multiplication. Okay, denotes matrix multiplication. And model dollar sign uh, scaling means you're extracting, uh, you're basically extracting this, the first two, yeah? All right, the first two uh, eigenvectors. The eigenvectors for LD1 and LD2. Of course, you could have extracted it for all of them, right? In this case, I'm, I'm just interested in the first two, right? So that would be uh, nine times two, all right? So this, you can see here, right? So over here, there are nine uh, rows and you're taking two columns, right? So this matrix is uh, nine times two. Uh, the reason why I have to force this as matrix is because your X, uh, is actually a data frame, right? So a data frame is basically a, a more general form of um, data structure where you can have uh, the data, the variables can be of different types, okay? There can be logical, it can be character and so on. So it's a more general uh, data object. Your matrix must be purely of the same type of uh, uh, data. For example, if it's all numeric, uh, all logical, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, so something like that. 
So therefore, if you try to multiply without forcing X to become a matrix, uh, you will get some errors, okay? And uh, the error is not because of anything else, it's just simply because of the data object is, is uh, not a matrix, right? So you just force it to become a matrix. And uh, the model scaling is uh, directly a matrix already, so you don't have to worry about it. So basically, you can see that the, the matrix multiplication is between a matrix that is uh, 214 rows times 9 columns multiplied by 9 rows and 2 columns. So this is conformable. And you should get a matrix that has 214 rows and 2 columns, right? And you can check, therefore check um, LD, okay? And that is what you get, okay? Two one four rows and two columns, just as uh, you expect from linear algebra results. Okay, so basically this gives you the linear discriminant scores for the LD one and LD two, and that allows you to uh, plot it as a scatter plot, uh, and you can actually tune it however you want. Okay, so let me share this with you. Okay, can you see the plot now? Yes. Okay, so here you can see more clearly that there is actually a cluster of the magenta over here. Um, the blue clusters somewhere around here. In fact, uh, closer inspection shows that this group also you can cluster a bit, the orange. All right, and then a bit of the blue as well here. Uh, but overall, this, this indicates a group that cannot be clustered well. They cannot, they, they kind of like just lump together, right? You can't separate their uh, class labels. Okay. So you can, of course, uh, explore different uh, combinations, but uh, just now, I think uh, from the pairwise scatter plot, you already have a bird's eye view of which which uh, scatter plot is most informative, all right? So you usually uh, use that to guide uh, which scatter plot you want to make uh, for final presentation. Okay, so of course uh, it's not perfect, but uh, it, it works better than your PCA. It's a small improvement. It can, sometimes it can lead to very uh, high improvement, sometimes a little bit, sometimes not much, all right? So it will, depend, it will vary from data to data, but it's a good technique to know. Okay. Okay. All right, okay. So, um, are there any questions that you want to ask about uh, LDA? Um, in general, right, uh, when should we actually decide to use LDA or it's just like a checking technique? So that means like whenever we go through a data mining, we should always look it. After looking into the scatter plots, then we can try out LDA and PCA as a, some sort of a standard checking procedure or it's just like when we see some evidence, then we apply LDA. There are actually several uses for LDA. Um, now, uh, we know that the dimension of the number of axes, right, uh, returned by LDA is equal to uh, the minimum of P, C minus one, right? So uh, in, 
Well, uh, sometimes this can be good or bad. Um, you see, if, if you have a binary problem, right? Binary uh, classification problem, your LDA will always give you uh, the dimension, the number of axes is always equal to one, right? Because it will take the smaller one. So what happens is that um, this, this kind of compression, sometimes it will work in your favor, but sometimes not. So it will lead to only one axis. And then uh, if you ask it to plot, right? Um, so maybe this is class zero. And sometimes the class one may be like this. Okay. So if you have something like this from LDA, uh, the immediate, uh, so immediately you know that uh, your, your classification uh, work is uh, promising. The reason is because once you have this LD scores, right, uh, for the two classes, then it becomes very simple to perform classification. You simply need to find some kind of a threshold. Find a cutoff. The cutoff can be anywhere. So usually this, this can be determined very easily by checking the different cutoffs. And then you, you at each cutoff, you will compute the uh, classification matrix and then you can evaluate the uh, performance metrics. All right, um, and then you, from there you can optimize uh, the cutoff that gives you the best performance matrix, metrics that you want. So, so like for example, somewhere around here, this, this you may end up with this cutoff, right? Which, which basically allows you to separate uh, most of the uh, classes uh, correctly. Okay, and once, uh, so this is one of the advantage. It immediately will tell you uh, if you're going to do classification work uh, and you, if you have got strong signals, it will immediately tell you this. But of course, again, this is a linear method, right? Uh, it's a linear transformation. So sometimes you will not be able to, if, if the, if the uh, classes are not linearly separable, then you will not be able to find this result, okay? And a lot of times, sometimes the classes are, are, are separable by some kind of non-linear process, okay? But not by a linear process. So um, if you are not aware of this, if you see some uh, strong overlaps, like for example, you have got one here, the other is like this. Then you kind of like think that, oh, okay, the classification is not going to be very promising. Um, that may not be true. Uh, it may actually mislead you, right? So, um, in that case, you might actually want to see whether the data is, uh, there are some nonlinear uh, functions that can separate your data better rather than linear function, right? So, again, remember that this uh, rotation is uh, a linear transformation, right? Now, um, the other thing is, is the following. Um, so suppose your, you have your C is a lot. Okay. Um, and then in this case, you, you may actually uh, easier to do uh, dimensional reduction, right? So, because again, the, the dimension is equal to minimum of uh, P and C minus one. So let's say you have five, but let's say your P is still kind of like a lot. Uh, maybe it's like 10 or something, right? So here you will, um, your dimension is like something like five, okay? And uh, unlike PCA, right? PCA then you may still have to kind of like do some kind of uh, feature selection, uh, things like that. Um, so usually for LDA, you can 
you can use all of them because there are already not a lot of them to begin with. Okay, so it's kind of like uh, maybe more convenient, I would say. Um, but this again, can, this convenience can be sometimes useful and sometimes uh, not so good. All right, so it will depend. Um, and then of course the other thing is to look for evidence of clustering. All right, it, it can actually uh, support your PCA in the sense that if you are trying to see whether it's promising to continue uh, a project to see whether there's any uh, whether the data can be classified properly. Uh, sometimes you run PCA, you will get those kind of uh, poor results like you see in the glass data and you may actually kind of like abandon the project at that stage. Um, so LDA can help you kind of like uh, give you some kind, if you run LDA and you see something, things improve, then generally is a good sign that uh, is the, the project is still worth doing, right? If you do LDA, uh, even after using label information, there's still nothing there. Um, probably the variables that they're using in the project are not going to be uh, useful for, for you to separate the classes, right? And then you might just want to stop the project at that stage and not look further. But that only apply for those linear, I mean, linear relationship, right? Instead of like, if let's say that's not linear, then uh, both of the PCA and LDA cases wouldn't be the benchmark to look over, is it? Uh, well, yeah, of course there are some uh, non-linear cases, like for example, let me see, the classic example is the circle. So suppose you have data point like this. There is actually a structure, but but like this. So the, the rest of them are like this. Okay. So this is your X one and this is your x2. Now, let's try to imagine if you do PCA, what will happen here? So, I guess... No um, matter which line also the same, right? The uh, yeah, line. because it's circular, right? So, so, we're doing the PCA over here, we'll basically not... Um, alter the, the um, this is no, this is circular, so, so where, whichever direction you are rotating is also the same. So basically when you do PCA, you, you get back um, more or less something like this structure, right? But then again, uh, in this structure, your data, when you look at it under PCA for this case, you see that there's actually clustering, which is the circle here. So. Uh, it is not exactly correct to say that um, even, even though sometimes you have non-linear things, uh, after you rotate, right, you can still see the patterns. Even you, your rotation is based on a linear transformation. So, yeah, so I would say that um, you use it as a kind of a guide for you to 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 well, if you, if you do PCA and you do LDA, you still cannot see any kind of structure, right, in the data. Um, possibly this is uh, giving you some kind of uh, uh, suggestion that uh, the variable that you use, you use may not be very informative, right? It, it's just kind of like, uh, uh, it's not definitive, but it's kind of like giving you a, a a kind of a uh, feeling, right? All right. Yeah. Unless you you maybe you you, may, you might need to try harder, like doing some kind of transformations of the data and, and uh, continue. So yeah. Understood that. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Well, anyway, it's a uh, it's actually a it's a tool that uh, you can uh, take into consideration. 
as part of your uh, toolkit, right? When you approach uh, data mining problems. All right, okay. So we have about 15 minutes. So maybe I just uh, quickly, um, so go into the idea of uh, uh, classification. Right? So classification is basically a very simple thing. You, you have uh, some kind of ob object, right? An object with a, an attribute vector. So let's say uh, we would usually represent this as uh, X transpose, right? So it could be, um, uh, this, this attribute vector can be uh, of, uh, it doesn't need to be all numbers. It can be of mixed type. For example, it can be uh, the age here. And this can be the sex, it can be the male or female. Um, this can be the um, education level. Maybe this is a uh, university. Um, and then this may be, you measure something like height, 185, weight, uh, 85, and, and so on, right? So basically this is your attribute vector. The idea is the following. Um, so given some kind of attribute vector, right? Can I put it in some class of interest. Okay, so your, you, for this, you basically have to build a classifier. So this classifier is like some kind of a machine, right? It's a, you can think of it as a mathematical function, a, a machine, whereby your your data enters here and here as output, right? So this is your input. For output, it will give you the class. Okay, so it may give you a, if you're binary, so you have zero one for binary case, uh, but of course it can, you can have multi-class case, which in, in that case you can have one, two, three, and four and so on, whatever, right? So it, it's, it's a very simple kind of, uh, idea uh, that you give a data input, the classifier should kind of like work out certain rules that assigns, allows it to assign your, uh, your object, right, to a class, okay, with a certain degree of accuracy. Okay, I think so this is uh, quite, um, clear to everyone. And so the, the thing here is that there are many kinds of classifiers. So the, it, so for the remainder of the, for the, of this course, we will study the different classifiers here in this box, right? Um, maybe know a bit about their, how they actually work and how do we actually, uh, um, so some of these classifiers, they have got some strengths and they've got some weaknesses, right? So, so we'll try to understand their, their strengths and weaknesses, all right? And then to learn how to evaluate their performance, right? Certain classifiers, they, they tend to work better on certain types of data uh, compared to other types. So, so again, uh, there is no classifier that wins all the time. All right, so that's why uh, we, we generally study uh, a set of classifiers and get familiar with them so that uh, we have in our possession several possible ways to attack a problem. And um, we then choose the one that is most appropriate. 
sometimes uh, all the tools they give more or less the same result so uh, in that case it doesn't really matter but sometimes the the differences are quite big right between different classifiers okay so in that case we will pick the one that is uh, uh, maybe perhaps doing doing uh, better all right okay so is it clear to you what classification is about yes okay now the simplest thing about classification is like this so suppose you have uh, only two variables right and firstly we have to develop some kind of intuition and uh, uh, intuition about what classification is the first intuition that is very useful to understand classification is geometry right um, I find that if you if you think of the classification problem in in the form of a geometry geometry problem, um, it basically solves a lot of your uh, issues, yeah, of understanding. For example, if you have these two groups of data, right? How would you classify? How would you? Uh, so your rule is the following: to classify, right? You have to devise a rule. Okay. If rule is satisfied, go to class, like in this case, class zero. If so else, you go to class one, all right? Because this is just a simple rule. In fact, uh, your rule can be actually quite uh, complex, but let's start with a simple rule, right? So over here, um, you can see that it's very clear, right? Um, well, they are actually so okay. I'll I'll let you I'll let you uh, maybe give some opinion. How would you separate these two parts of data? Just devise a rule. You can actually draw on it, right? So if you want to, you can draw on it. Okay. Um, so yeah, it will be. I mean, sorry for the not so straight line. Okay. All right, that is uh, one possibility. Anyone else wants to try? Oh, the line will disappear on its own. Uh, I can clear it from my oh, end. Okay. Okay. Uh, other possibilities? Or well, you just leave the line on the on the diagram. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Who else wants to try? Okay, whose line is this? The green line is from who? Me, me, Chao Hong. Chao Hong, ah, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else wants to try? Anyone else? Yeah, this is still me. Yep. <laughs> okay, you can cut like that. Well, of course, if you cut cut like uh, that, you will make uh, a little bit of errors, right? 
But that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. We we not too much concerned about errors now. Okay, so there are actually it turns out that there, there are actually many, many ways to do this rule. Okay. Um this is a geometry, something like this. You can you can have some line like this, some line like this, or, or whatever, right? So it turns out that there are actually a lot, a huge number of rules that you can actually use to classify um, uh, objects here in this uh, simple space. Um, but generally following the idea of, uh, in, in science we follow uh, the principle of Kemp's razor. So which basically is like we, we use a simple model, the sim use the simplest model, but not any simpler. Which means, okay, here it means the following. Uh, the simplest model does not mean that uh, Simplest model, but not any simpler. It does not mean that you always use some linear model, right? It just means that if, in this case, in this case here, your simplest model is indeed a linear model, right? So basically a line will do. But then again, uh, if you draw a line, right? The question is, uh, there are so many possible lines, right? If, if you draw a line, you can draw a line like this, oops. You can draw a line like this. You can draw a line like this. You can draw a line like this and so on and so forth, right? There are so many ways to draw a line, even for the straight line. So how do we decide, right? Which line is the best one, right? Uh, in some cases, you will find that your data might be like this. So in this case, the simplest model for your simplest rule that you can do is actually a quadratic rule and not a linear rule. Right? Your linear rule will actually not work here. You try to put a straight line through uh, as a rule to separate these two piles, it's not going to work very well, right? No matter how you cut, you're just going to include some, some of the other classes inside, right? But then a quadratic rule will work perfectly in this case, okay? That is what is meant by use the simplest model but not any simpler, okay? Now, okay, so, so uh, the simplest one is to com consider the problem from a geometrical point of view, um, which basically means that you have to find some kind of like a, a geometry, right, to separate. Now, this is in two dimension. If you have three dimensions, right, what will happen to the geometry? Suppose you have three dimensions like this. So your data points are sitting uh, maybe like this. Okay. All right. So here, if you want to separate these two piles, right, you can actually uh, have a plane. You have a plane, uh, this is like three dimension, right? So you have a plane that's going like this. So anything below the plane, you will classify as uh, so below this plane, you classify as minus. Above the plane, you classify as plus, right? So the decision rule here is actually this, this plane here. Of course, this plane need not be uh, a sheet, right? A linear plane. It can be also a curved plane. Like for example, uh, you could actually have just like in the case of uh, a two dimension, uh, you might actually have sometimes find that uh, um, so let's say you have something like spherical around here. So you might find that there's a, if you have a plane like this,
you have to have some imagination like the it's like a piece of kind of like a, a, a kind of like curved plane right so this curved plane can also separate these two piles of data all right so that is also a decision rule and these decision rules are basically geometrical objects okay and of course if you move to higher dimension then this this uh, decision rules they are basically abstract geometrical objects right they are in uh, four dimensional space five dimensional space and once it moves out of three dimensional space you cannot actually visualize them anymore but then the idea is that it is still a geometrical object right so your decision rule uh, in the in a lot of uh, classifiers they are actually geometrical objects okay so linear if you have linear models uh, then your decision rules are basically what we call hyperplanes all right they are kind of like uh, uh, things like this in, in one dimension is a line two dimension is like a plate like this then three dimensions and so on is just like uh, something what we call a hyperplane right okay so the first intuition that you have to develop when you think about classification is uh, geometry okay because with this geometrical thinking it will lead you to a lot of um, it will help you understand uh, many of these classifiers uh, very well right even without um, even without looking at the math you you already have a very good idea what these methods uh, uh, what, what kind of working principles they they operate on and that can be very useful for applied work okay All right okay so uh, it's 7 30 so let's uh, take a break now and then we come back at eight o'clock okay 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 all right okay so so we looked at um, methods that are based on geometry um, Uh, which forms an important class of uh, classifier methods in, in uh, for classification work. And then um, there's another class which is based on um, uh, probability. Probability-based uh, methods. So the idea is very simple. So if you could assign a probability to a part so so basically you if you could assign a probability measure to um, so it should be like this okay so given a particular data vector uh, the probability that it belongs to some class right c equals to one let's say for example yeah so given this uh, attribute right the probability that it is classified as um, let's say a uh, class one is equal to some particular value right let's say all right so you could use this to classify um, so you the, the idea is that you somehow you are able to convert this uh, attribute vector into a probability and suppose you have some kind of distribution like this right for let's say um, uh, right so this may be for let's say a uh, class zero and this may be class one right so this is from zero to one so this is your density right okay so if you have a situation like this then um okay is is quite okay um let me see all right <clears throat> so based on so you have a distribution right of this uh, particular um, for class zero you'll find a distribution of the probability values and then class one has another distribution 
if they don't overlap too much, right, then you can actually uh, use classification as such. For example, if let's say you have a particular data vector, right, uh, let's say new, right, and you, you find this property to be here, okay? And for this, you will um, classify it as being class zero, right? Uh, <clears throat> so usually for this kind of property-based methods, after you have this, we will find some kind of cutoff, right? So let's say, for example, this is the cutoff. So anything that is towards the left, you will classify as zero. Anything towards the right, you will classify as one. All right, so, uh, and of course, uh, the cutoffs, if you pay, place it in different positions, they will have, uh, they will give you different performance uh, uh, metrics, right? So, so usually you will place it at a, um, you'll place the cutoff in such a way that you optimize certain performance metrics, all right? And let's say if, if you calculate this probability and it falls somewhere around here, then uh, according to this cutoff, you would classify it as uh, class one. All right. Um, the most popular method, in, uh, probability based method is the logistic regression. So the logistic regression, basically you have probability of um, Y equals to a particular class, let's say class one, given the data vector, right? And this is equal to uh, the exponent of uh, beta uh, naught plus beta one uh, x one plus so on. Okay, until okay. So so this is the logistic regression model. Um, if you take log, then you will get. Oh, sorry, I think it's the odds. Um, sorry, it's, it's the, it, the model is based on odds. This one over uh, P Y equals to zero, okay? All right, so this, this whole thing is called an odds for Y equals to one, right? <clears throat> then you take the log of uh, the odds, so generally this will be, okay. Um, and so this will, the exponent will disappear. So you end up with this. And then uh, you have, following okay and finally you have um, so so you rearrange this you will get sorry there's no more there's no more e yeah So, wait, let me see. So, log. Okay, okay, right. That's E. Okay, that's E, sorry. So, um, minus P, Y goes to 1. E of this, right. So, you rearrange this, you will get... Um, generally, this can be further simplified as the following. By multiplication on the numerator and the denominator, you'll multiply by this particular exponent of the negative. 
so then it will cancel off the numerator and then the denominator it will also cancel off one of them right so so you end up uh, having a formula for your probability of uh, being in class one given a uh, particular attribute vector right so basically your attribute vector information goes in here and then uh, you can then uh, assign a probability measure to that attribute vector okay so this is a, a very commonly used uh, method please note that in when you do logistic regression right um, uh, in machine learning you are basically just interested in using the uh, probability values here all right you are not interested in doing hypothesis tests yeah like for example if you take a course in glm um, logistic regression is used to in in what we call explanatory models okay so they are trying to find out which uh, variables are significant uh, uh, ex explanatory variables and those kind of work are, are slightly different from the machine learning work right because for those work they they are not exactly interested in making predictions but they are they are more interested in knowing which of the um, variables um, are statistically associated with the outcome right? outcome of interest which is the uh, class label so uh, do take note of that, yeah? In, in machine learning, we are just interested to uh, obtain a probability measure for the data attribute to build the distribution of the uh, probabilities. And then from there, we will determine a cutoff that we will use as a decision rule, okay? So this is the, the main idea for probability-based methods. The other method that is also uh, very popular is a method called uh, naive base. So naive base is also based on the is based on the Bayes theorem, um, and <clears throat> and later we will look at it more more in more detail. But it's based on the Bayes theorem, and um, basically it it also assigns a, a probability value to uh, a particular data attribute, right? It's just a different method of assigning um, this, this uh, data, uh, uh, data vector, a, a particular probability value. And uh, re in the math approach is the same. So you will have, still have two distributions of probability values and then look for a cutoff, all right? Okay, so these are the um, probability based uh, values. So is it, is it clear to you? Yes. Okay, then you have a closely related uh, method called, uh, which is a likelihood based method. Now, just now, um, the likelihood-based method is actually quite, it's, it has a subtle difference with probability-based uh, methods. For example, just now you, you maybe have, let's say you managed to get these two distributions, right? This is class one and this is class zero, okay? Um, let me just color this part. All right, so unlike uh, probability-based values, they, we are not interested in this probabilities, but the, we, are, we are interested in the likelihood. So the likelihood is actually the height of this uh, distribution function. It's looking at this height. So for example, let's say if uh, I have a data point, like I, I have a, a, an attribute vector and it falls here. Uh, I have an attribute vector that um, uh, 
uh, maps it to to this particular position. All right. Okay. Um, and then my question now is, do I assign it to zero or one? All right. The way to assign this using likelihood based method is to compare the likelihood at these two points. So I can compare the likelihood of the, okay, of the new data point uh, for class zero. All right. I compare it against the likelihood of one right basically uh, so one the likelihood will be this high right up to here okay so this is uh less than uh if so so i come i look at this uh comparison right um uh, <clears throat> if my lambda is larger than one right if my lambda is larger than one meaning that the likelihood right is basically uh like for example coming to places like this, my lambda will be larger than one, right? Because my likelihood of being in zero is higher than, the height is basically higher uh, than the other height, right? So if my lambda is larger than one, uh, I, will I will label it, I will classify as zero, right? Uh, otherwise, classify as one, okay? Um, for practical purposes, uh, generally you, it's almost, uh, impossible to, to, of course you have an intersection point here, but this is a basically built, um, uh, in, in practice, you basically will, will almost not have, uh, points like this, right? When you build it with, with, um, data rather than, um, do a theoretical curve like this. So generally, lambda equals to one uh, generally does not happen for actual data. Um, however, if it, if it still happens, right, if it anyhow happened, um, then the only way you can say is that it's uh, undetermined. All right, so you basically just kind of like give it a status that is undetermined. That means uh, you can't judge, right? It, it could be either class zero or class one with uh, equal likelihood. Okay, so the likelihood method is basically based on comparison. You need to have a, a, uh, a probability uh, distribution model. Okay, you need to have a probability distribution model so that you can actually um, use this approach. Uh, or maybe sometimes you may just use a non-parametric method called uh, kernel, kernel density estimation, KDE. All right, um, so the K KDE is basically when you have data, right, it estimates, uh, some kind of a uh, function, right? Using a non param like for example, you have data like this, okay? It will uh, estimate a smooth function using non-parametric uh, methods, right? Um, um, it's called a kernel density estimation, right? So, so once you have this function, it has a functional form, right? F, it has a function fx, so this will be your likelihood, okay? And then the other one, you have another curve, so you have another likelihood, right? Of course, this can actually, um, likelihood methods can, can, can be used in high dimensions. This is a low dimensional representation. Let me show you um, high dimensions, uh, like if you have two dimensions, it can be quite interesting, so like this.
Okay, so if you have these two uh, pluses, right, and they form some kind of, uh, so, so this is two-dimensional, um, you can actually put a, a model on that. Uh, let's say you use uh, something called a Gaussian uh, kernel density. So basically, it's like you you model this distribution using some kind of a, a model, uh, something called Gaussian kernel density. So what happens is that it will estimate uh, the height, right? So it will kind of like uh, it, it will you will get the, another axis which is the height here. Um, so the height here, so you can imagine that they they have some some kind of uh, they 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 look like mountains, right? Um, so, so the covering these regions, and if you cut the mountains at different intervals, then you will get a contour. So, for example, uh, you will get a contour like this. For this one, you will get a contour, maybe something like this. Okay, the contour of course can be colored by their by the probability that they actually uh, uh the, the probability coverage. For example, the one that is densely covered, you know that those those have a lot of data concentration for that particular class. And um those areas will be uh, so for example here will be very high likelihood. The likelihood is very high for the minus. So the core, the core areas, yeah. So the likelihood will be very uh, high at the core areas here, yeah, right? And these are the edges, right? So the edges, they usually have, have a lower likelihood. So what happens when you have, let's say a data point uh, comes into this particular position. So it basically will uh, again go back to this method whereby it will just check the likelihood, yeah? Just that in this case, your likelihood is the height of this uh, uh, this this mountain here. Right? Then you will basically still use this approach to compare, and uh, whichever one is larger, it will assign to that particular class. Okay, this can be useful. This kind of method can be very useful when you have a lot of overlaps, right? Like for example. Let's say this, this thing extends, there's a bit of the minus here, but there's very little. So it actually extends a bit here, but the density is actually very low, yeah? Okay, so uh, if you use standard methods, uh, like geometric methods, you might have actually uh, quite a hard time um, creating a kind of geometry that will give you very smooth partitions, but if you use this uh, likelihood-based method, you may find that uh, most of the time your problem is solved because um, you see, if this is the tail area, right, it has very little uh, weight. So it's the likelihood is actually quite low. So when it comes to the center here, right, even though there's overlap, if your data point comes in the center here, it will classify it as the red one because its likelihood is higher, right? It has a higher concentration around this region. Okay, so so um, this is kind of like a very uh, non-linear way of assigning uh, classes using likelihood methods. And sometimes this method can be very useful when you are dealing with uh, very weird kinds of uh, your uh, distribution, right? Sometimes your, your class, right? It may dist be distributed all over the place. Um, like for example, it may be distributed um, it need not be continuous, you know, it may be distributed like this. With something that is like this. Okay, these are the same class, but it, it goes into two parts, right? And with this kind of method, you can have the kernels, then you will have the contours over here. Then there's another contour over here. So basically, if you have uh, data points around here, it will classify as this part, right? And data points around here will go here. And data points that come near this part here, it will classify as the circles, right? 
Okay, so likelihood based uh, methods. Um, so is it okay, this, this uh, method, the idea? Yeah, I think so. Need time to digest. Need time to digest. The kernel density, is it often used, the one that you see in the, is SVM, if I'm not mistaken? No, that's a kernel function. It's a different, it's slightly different. Slightly. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's a different idea from this one. This here, your, you see your, I don't know, you, are you able to imagine the, that this is actually a mountain? Yes, I can. I, I can know that. I mean, if it's a contour, yes. Because yes. Uh, the base is actually, the, you are kind of like looking at it from the top of the mountain, right? So that's why you only see the flatness, because you are looking yeah. directly from uh, yeah. the top. Uh, in order to kind of like visualize the, that this is kind of like a mountain, so you think of like cutting the mountain at different slices. Yeah. Uh, and that will give you the contours. So it's a general way of depicting a three-dimensional object on two-dimensional space. I think maybe I don't know, like last time uh, when they studied uh, geography or something like that, there, there are some lessons about like, you yeah. know. Was... Yeah, contour plot, yeah. Yeah, it's like, um, it's easier to explain the gradient descent also like you are using a contour plot, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hin Chun asks, are these methods assuming only two clusters? No, uh, it can be multiple clusters. Your, I just use two clusters for, sim for simplicity of explanation. All these methods can cover uh, multiple clusters. So, so basically then, uh, if you've got three clusters, right? So you, let's say you will have if three classes, maybe it'll be just something like this. I said I make an extension here. Okay, let me clear this. So, uh, maybe you have something like this. Um, and something like this. Then maybe something like this. Okay, so you have, um, so you basically will look, in that case, you basically will just look at it like this, uh, likelihood of x, t in, uh, so let's say this is one, two, and three, five. one, two, and three, okay? Then you take the max. All right, uh, you take the max and then basically the class is you basically argument that maximizes this thing. So the argument is uh, the class here, like C1, C2, and C3. Okay, so, so for more than two classes, uh, instead of using, actually this is more general. Uh, I mean, I use the ratio, um, well, it, it's still the same thing, right? Uh, but for more than two classes, uh, the ratio is not, that useful, so you just basically um, evaluate the likelihood of these three uh, classes at, uh, at the uh, data vector, and then you find, you maximize it, right? So one of them is the maximum, right? And uh, you find which one maximizes, so it's either the one, so the answer here is either one, two, or three, so uh, if you use the argument of the max. Okay, so, so basically this is just how it assigns. Uh, conceptually, it's actually very simple. So this, this, is, this would be how statisticians approach machine learning problems, right? You know machine learning, um, a lot of machine learning uh, work is actually done by computer science people. Um, they are the ones who come up with all these um, things like neural network, um, 
and things like uh, support vector machine, right? Those, those things are something like what they did. But uh, actually all these have a very, uh, they have actually connections with, with statistics. It's just that the people in statistics, they, they may actually use methods that are more kind of like based on likelihood methods. Like for example, these kind of methods, they were all developed by statisticians. Not, uh, the comp science people didn't uh, quite work on this type of things because, um, because of their training, right? So they are, they, are, they are more into this kind of iterative algorithmic like uh, classifiers rather than uh, model-based, um, uh, likelihood-based uh, methods. Okay, so so that, that may explain a bit of a divergence in tradition, right? You, you ask a statistician to do machine learning, so they, they usually will, will like to use logistic regression a lot because it's very familiar to them. Okay, but the comp science, comp science people will like to use things like support vector machine uh, because it's more familiar to them. Okay, but, but uh, again, uh, all these are just uh, tools, right? Um, if you are able to learn all of them and then uh, pick when is the right time to use which one, uh, I think that is, that is actually better. Rather than let's say you, 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 you just stick to certain types of methods and so on. Because all, all these methods have their have their own strengths and weaknesses, yeah. Yeah, doctor, I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, is this statistically correct to like link one data point, right? And then we will have the like some kind of the likelihood probability of that belong to which class, right? So, can we convert this to the confidence of belonging of this data towards? Class one, two, or three. You mean so, you want to convert it to a like how confidence that this data point is uh, going to class one, two, or three relatively? You okay? So in that case, that would be something like converting it uh, to a. Well, maybe you, you can compare, let's say, um, L1 to, so let's say you, you set a reference, right? Let's say our reference is one. So you will do uh, L2, L1, L3 over L1, right? Of course your reference is, is L1 over L1, right? So let's say you, for the data point you get, you get something like this. So then, uh, in this case, you would of course uh, classify it as uh, one. All right. But then again, uh, wouldn't this this be similar to this one? I would I would think it think of it like that. Or if you don't want to assign it like this, you can actually basically uh, just output. Um, the result as such, uh, maybe you just need these two vectors, right? So you your output will be um, uh, the average. So so instead of kind of like saying that it is uh, one, two, or three, you you basically say that well, this is the evidence that um, in favor of L two. This is the evidence in favor of L three rather than L one. So you for the rest, you can basically um, do the same. So for this, uh, later after you have this, right, you can actually further look at it. Um, I think, uh, this, since this is two-dimensional, so you will have something like this. So you can look at the, the distribution. And then maybe, I don't know, work something out from here. Also, it means the, the lowest uh, value of the later two, 0 0.5 and 0 0.05, right? The lowest of them. The lower of them, right? The uh, higher the confidence you are, la, that you are in. Yeah, in one. Oh, makes sense. Like some, yeah, you know, this one has, of course, it can exceed, right? This can be two point one. This can be zero point one. So in this case, uh, you are actually more confident that it is actually in two, 
rather than one. But I don't know, this, this may be uh, kind of like a, um, generally people may, may just settle at this kind of, uh, at this level, but of course there are, there are all sorts of ways to do refinement. Huh? Maybe you're looking at that. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, so what have we covered? So we have covered uh, geomet geometric methods. Then we cover um, geometric methods and after that we have uh, probability. Then we have um, likelihood. Okay. Now there's a kind of method, uh, we are not going to talk about uh, a particular kind of uh, classifier is called the associate. I think it's called associative rules. Um, so we are not going to use this because uh, this is mostly used in a kind of uh, analysis called uh, something I don't know a basket basket analysis or something like that. Yeah. Market basket. Yeah, market uh, basket analysis. They they particularly use a kind of associative, uh, an algorithm called associative rules. So uh, we are not covering this. This is a very kind of like com science. Um, uh, it, 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 I think it was mainly developed in com com science uh, among the com science people. So uh, if you're interested, you can read this. I think this is. Um, they try to kind of like, uh, it's basically more algorithmic kind of thing. It's like uh, you want to... Buy product A and uh, then see who is most likely to buy product B as well. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's like uh, usually the supermarkets, they all have this. So yeah. they have your checkout items, right? You, you buy every time your what things you check out, they will correlate together, isn't it? Yes. So, yeah, so then from that last large list of uh, grocery uh, list that you buy, they are trying to see what objects they are always going together. Okay, so then they know that uh, people who buy this thing, they will uh, almost always buy the other object, right? So they want to know that. And um, that's why uh, they use this kind of, uh, they, with this knowledge, right, they can actually uh, do this kind of promotion. Nah. Then they say they got discount. Or sales, upsells. Uh, sales for certain things because then the other object, right? They they never do sales one at all. So so like let's yeah. say um you have two two things that you buy, right? Let's say you 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 buy um I don't know like what's reasonable um, beer um, and the uh, diaper. One of okay. the case study from yeah the beer what was that beer and diapers? Yeah, beer and diapers. So uh. I think there's one case studies on this US, I forget what's the shop name already. So they found out that beer and diapers is often bought together. Right. Because of the men going out to buy the kids things and also buy their beers a lot. Yeah. So so if you know that it's always like there's an association like this, um, then what happens is that uh, you may actually uh, actually increase the price of uh, let's say the, the beer uh, and then but you do a, a promotion on the diapers so then actually these people will actually uh, end up buying the expensive beer you know, because they usually buy both things together yep. so so um, that's why now you know like uh, why they routinely do this kind of uh, discounts sometimes it's to clear the stock but sometimes they they have this kind of uh, program right they they well, I think this nowadays these kind of things they already have uh, software to uh, help them like uh, come up with uh, uh, what are the strategies to do things. So because I think it's a very well studied problem, okay. But since it's very kind of like a uh, concise thing, so we we are not covering it in this this course. Yeah. Okay, it, it's more like a, there's not much statistical content that that goes on there. It's more like a, a very algorithmic. But but you if you want to read out about it, uh, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, it, I think it's quite an interesting um, study, right? How people can use uh, correlated items to 
to aid in decision making. Okay. Um, then I'm going to talk about, uh, so you have these three, then you have um, the tree method, tree based. All right, so, so let's look at the tree based method. Okay, so let's say the tree based method basically is, is quite uh, interesting. I think uh, it is, is both interesting in terms of um, the, the simplicity of the algorithm in some sense, uh, and also in terms of its uh, further generalizability to some ensemble methods like random forests. Right? Uh, so this class of uh, classifier is very important. Um, and I would suggest that uh, you, you, you uh, spend some time to get familiar with the, uh, uh, this, this uh, classifier. In fact, last Sam, we, I think for those who took the consulting course, right, we learned how to use a program called Guide. Uh, that program is very powerful, okay? So if you know how to use it properly, you can uh, solve your classification problem in using trees very quickly, all right? So and let's look at the general idea. So the general idea is like this. Um, okay, let's say, suppose you have a, So again, something like a case like this. So if you're going to use a tree approach, so this is how you're going to uh, to solve the problem. So so your goal is to develop a classifier that is based on uh, binary splits. Okay, using a tree structure. So first of this, uh, you may actually say, well, maybe I split around here. So let's say this value is five, okay? So this is my X1, this is my X2. So I will write like this. So this is the root node, I will write as one. Uh, so if my X1 is less than or equals to five, I will go to this direction. Basically it's this direction, right? And the other direction is my X1 is larger than five. So it will go to this direction. So from here, you see that all of them are negative. So you already classify as negative. Okay. Then we come to this, this space. Now you look at this carefully. Your tree is basically partitioning your variable space right, by cutting it into uh, non-overlapping pieces. So the idea of partitioning is very uh, important. So then you have this, you partition like this. So let's say this is uh, maybe uh, two. So then over here you have your node two. And so node two you will have, um, this is below two, right? So x two below or equals to two, you will classify. So since all of these are negative, so minus. So over here, if they are larger than two, So now just than two, then it is talking about this particular space, right? So now we are we are coming to um, this particular, right? Sorry. Uh, so this particular space here, okay? Now, um, so then we continue, right? So let's see over here. Then we see that if we cut like this. So this can be separated into negative. So this is will be my node tree. I will I will cut it, and so this value is uh, let's say uh, four. So if my x one is less than or equals to four, uh, all of them I classify as negative. So after that. So it is left uh, this part, right? Then only this segment is left. 
Okay. So for the last segment, I will partition here. All right. Which will give me uh this will be four x one more than four. So then I partition here. So let's say this is uh, five. So my x two less than or equals to five will be all this positive and x2 greater than 5 will be negative okay so this is your tree all right and in fact the tree and the partition on the the partition diagram on the uh, scatter plot is actually uh, they are supporting each other right so they are basically uh, this is a more com the tree structure is a more compact representation of what is going on on the uh, scatter plot Okay, so is it clear to you how the uh, idea actually works? Yes. So the, I, I think the idea wise is actually uh, quite easy to grasp, except that the main difference is that they are actually, um, the, so the, the actual implementation problem is how do you decide where to cut? Because there are so many possibilities, right? You can cut here, you can cut here, you can cut here. There are many possibilities, okay? So uh, in fact, they need an algorithm to, to cut, right? And these algorithms, they, they, they are slightly complicated. Um, they, they have to scan through all these potential values and then decide on wh where is the best place to cut. And they decide on this using some kind of measure called an impurity measure which basically is looking at the amount of uh, variation, right? So for example, if they cut, let's say, uh, let's say you have two piles of data here. If you cut here, the uh, between group variation is much stronger than the within group uh, variation. So if you cut here, then this group is all by itself. This group is all by itself. So there's no, that's why they use the term called impurity measure. So there's no impurity, so this, this would be the best cut. If you cut somewhere like here, it's pure over here, but there are impurities over here. So later when we study it more clearly, we will um, look at uh, what impurity measure actually is. They use some kind of measure. Okay, so then um, the rest is basically they, they um, look at it, uh, they develop the algorithm for building the tree. All right, which is actually a, a very computationally intensive uh, 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 kind of uh, work, right? Okay, and um, this method later will lend you to something called a random forest. So, um, so random forest, maybe I just quickly uh, talk about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a very difficult uh, idea. So basically, the thing is that for the random forest, you from, from your data, right? Let's say you got p variables, okay? So you will basically create, um, you will subsample the columns here. Like maybe you'll subsample, let's say one third of it, for example, randomly. So you will have maybe some variables like x1, x5, x9, and so on. Um, the other data set you have x4, x6, x11, and so on, right? So, so you subsample it, right? So these are basically uh, what we call in kind of like a weak. So it's a weakened form of your, of your original uh, data. Using the weakened form, you make the tree, right? So there will be a tree. Okay, you, you make a classifier. So the classifiers are all different, right? So because the data is different, so the classifier is different, right? So then you have so many trees, right? Maybe you make 1000 trees. Okay. And then what happens is that when you have a data matrix, a data vector, you will put it through all these 1000 trees. Okay. 
So, so all these 1,000 trees will basically make a prediction about uh, your class for your attribute vector here. So maybe this tree will say that it is one. The other tree may be zero, uh, call it zero. Some trees will call it one, right? So you've got a bunch of zeros and ones. Okay, predictions. Like in a binary case, I'm using a binary case example. In a multicast example, it's the same, yeah? Uh, it will predict as 0, 1, 2, or whatever, right? Depending on how many classes you have. And after that, it adopts what we call a majority rule. So, so basically, if you look at this, uh, let's say you go, if uh, number of 1 is equal to 650, then uh, this is the majority, right? And then you will basically predict uh, your new data vector as belonging to class one, okay? So uh, this is the general idea of a random forest. And um, it has been found that this uh, way of making the decision, right? Instead of relying on one tree, you rely on many, many uh, trees that are weaker forms, right? Um, it actually can improve um, the performance of the classifier. So this is an important ex extension, yeah, the random forest. Okay, have you come across random forest before? At least the term. Yes. Uh, actually, in fact, random forest just re refers to the methodology, right, of um, subsampling. And then you basically over here, when you build the classifier, it can be anything. It can be your, um, it can be your SVM actually. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's just that traditionally, uh, because it was first uh, uh, developed um, together with decision trees, uh, that's why uh, when people say they do random forest, they, they basically, they implicitly, they are actually doing also their classifier is actually a tree. But uh, in fact, you, if you want to, you can actually uh, do a random forest with your support vector machine. You can do a random forest for your logistic regression and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's definitely possible. Right? Okay. So tree based. Um, okay, done. And then we move on to um yeah that's a question because right uh in general we we have to choose a threshold for other kinds of models like i mean like let's say a uh, logistic regression those that is with probability one then when it comes to the random forest if let's say we are applying random forest with logistic regression then yeah. should, should how, how should we adjust the threshold itself actually then the threshold will we have to be adjusted for each of the tree itself yeah the each of the uh, trees the the trees using subsampling uh, that's why this method is very computationally intensive because you will have to repeat the so so you you see that the operation of doing finding the cutoff right will have to be repeated for every tree Yes. So, yeah. so that's why this method is very uh, computational. Yeah. Uh, because you have to look through, like, if you do 1,000 times, then depend if you spend, like, let's say, one minute to get the work done, right? Let's say one minute. Then you do 1,000 trees. Uh, in principle, you will expect to spend up to 1,000 minutes um, to complete the random forest. Yeah. That is actually a lot of time. Um, so, but then of course, one minute is actually an exaggeration. Usually you get this done in like a second or even less than one second. Um, so I think generally it, it is manageable with current computing uh, resources. But a uh, random forest is like a bagging method, right? So the 1000 trees actually can run simultaneously at the same time if we paralyze it. It's, uh, it's not like the boosting method that needs sequentially to need the sequential run so the update, to be back to your case, still okay, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, like that. That's like uh, you are speeding it up by um, multi processing. Per per your number of call. Yeah, yeah, you're using infrastructure to speed it up. So the speed up can be done uh, usually two ways. Uh, one is algorithmic. You're using the algorithm, so you have something more efficient. So it will speed up, of course. The other way is to distribute the workload, the computational load to different uh, Faster. Yeah, calculation Cal load yeah, in your hardware. So uh, yeah, so so those are actually quite quite uh, standard ways to speed up. Um uh, yeah, so okay, so that's uh good feedback from you. Uh so where was I? Okay, so then the next one is you have the um, I would say something more like algorithmic methods or simply I uh, maybe something like a black box. Okay, so this class of method is actually um, the, the, the best example is in this case, we're studying something called neural network, artificial neural network, right? Artificial neural network. And this is a precursor to uh, something called uh, deep learning, which you keep hearing all the time. Lah. Um, this itself is actually a rather um, uh, advanced kind of topic, so we will not go into that. But deep learning is basically uh, uh, if if you want to know more about deep learning, you first have to understand uh, artificial neural network, right? Because uh, they 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 it actually builds on ANN. So this ANN method is actually. Uh, I would say it's a it's a very abstract method, right? It it uh, there's no no um, at least to me that there is no intuitive way to really understand it. Um, so it goes like this. So first, you create a kind of a network representation. So basically. Um, Let's say you have a variable x1, x2, x3, and x4, right? So they will, they kind of like enter this network by these nodes. One, two, three, four. These are called nodes. Okay. And then after that, they may actually go to, let's say a simple one, maybe something like this. Maybe something before this. Okay, so this this is a layer. So you you have a uh, one layer here with uh, let's say I use five, six, seven, eight. So these are the node numbers. So you can actually make connections from each node to every other node. So this is what we call a uh, fully connected graph, right? Uh, this will be what we call a fully connected graph. And after that, you may have something like this, nine, and then here, right. okay. So this this um, this is actually a, uh, an edge, right? So the edge will actually represent uh, a kind of like a weight. It's a parameter, right? So so basically, um, so over here this node, right? It will receive the weight from one with input one, yeah, and then it receive the weight from two. Of input two, it receives the weight from input three, and it receives the weight from input four. Right? Okay, so you basically have a linear uh, function like this, and um, 
So this this is some some so you get some value here. Right? Um and then over so so over here you have a further weight. Let's say this is W5 and so on. So all these have got weights. Okay. So over here, I think uh, if I remember correctly, um, so you have got a value t here, right? And then you 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 use this value t uh, and go inside some kind of function. Uh, maybe we call an activation. This one is some kind of a uh, activation function. So this function can be something like um, uh, maybe a sigmoid function. Okay, maybe some kind of a constant function or so on, right? There, there are some uh, kind of forms, okay? This is actually quite abstract. So the reason why you have sigmoid function or whatever function, no explanation. It's just, well, just try some models, yeah? So basically you have, uh, so for this one, you will have ft, uh, let's say I have ft1. So, so over here, I will have ft2 and so on, yeah? Okay. All right. So so then I will have W five times F T um, let's say five plus W six times F T six and so on. Yeah. So basically you see uh initially your weights here they are multiplied with the input, but then after that at the uh once it goes through a layer, right? Uh those kind of information is kind of like transform using uh, these functions, right? So now that your, your uh, sum here, your linear function here is some weight multiplied by the function, okay? And you add up everything here, right? So over here, right, um, you will have everything added up. W5 FT5 plus until in this case will be W8 FT8. So you look at this value, and then you set a threshold. If it exceeds this threshold, you will, you will classify as plus. Uh, otherwise, as minus. Okay? So, so this is a general idea. Um, you've got the parameters that are the weights. These, so all these uh, edges have got weights. And, and you have activation functions. And then the idea is just to repeatedly, iteratively um, use the values that you get from previous layer. And then uh, you repeatedly fit them into iteratively into these uh, functions. You construct another linear function. And then you keep on going. It can be very deep. Yeah? Your layers can be a lot. And it seems like you, if you do enough layers, right, um, the experience is that uh, this final decision rule, right? Uh, the linear uh, function here exceeding certain threshold seems to be a very, uh, uh, it can give very good results, right? Uh, uh, mysteriously. Okay, and people have been trying to understand uh, why this actually happens, but I think um, it is actually very hard because uh, it's kind of like um, the information, initial information here is being kind of like uh, iteratively, maybe, maybe when it goes through all these uh, layers, you are actually amplifying signals and removing noise. Uh, it, it's actually unclear to me, right? It's just that we know that it's iteratively done using this. And the choice of the activation function can make a big difference. Okay, so... Um, so yeah, this is your, your neural network. And uh, um, if you don't find it abstract, let me know. <laughs> so the idea for this uh, neural network is, is coming from um, uh, some computer scientists who talk to biologists about the brain, like they wanted to understand maybe, you know, the brain is a, uh, in some sense, it's a very um, powerful kind of uh, computing device, right? Uh, because it can do pattern recognition very quickly, right? So definitely, there's uh, some kind of computing involved. But uh, they're trying to so they're trying to see whether uh, they can 
under, from the biology, they can maybe develop a kind of model. So um, when they look at this network, right, they were thinking of the nodes as some kind of a brain cell, right, the interconnections of the brain cells. Uh, but then after that, uh, things became abstract. And, and today, basically, it's just um, when you want to do artificial neural network, basically, you just need to specify the architecture. All right, the architecture of the network, like how many layers you want it to have. Um, and maybe there are some uh, rules to prune some of these uh, edges, right? Like, for example, if the edges, the weight is very low, you basically just get rid of the edge and things like that, right? So, so and then uh, a lot of the computational work uh, goes in actually calculating these weights, estimating these weights. So these weights have to be iteratively uh, refined. All right, so, so there's uh, some kind of uh, algorithm to, to, you have some initial weights and then it will keep updating itself until it stabilizes around certain values. Uh, and then finally, it will, after all these weights are stabilized, then, um, uh, then it will, you, you can use it, right? Then you have stable, stable behavior. Okay, so, um, so it turns out that uh, this neural network is very powerful um, and also very abstract. And, um, and one thing can be uh, said about, uh, now this thing is very powerful, but there is actually a danger with this tool. Um, you can easily uh, overfit any sort of um, uh, classification problem with a neural network. Okay, overfitting in this case means that you make the uh, model uh, with many layers, right? So it becomes overly complicated, and uh, it will pick up every every sort of uh, variation that is in your training set, right? So it will overfit your data very easily. Uh, if you tune the parameters too much, okay? So overfitting is a problem in, in classification because you definitely don't want this kind of models. Like for example, the simplest case is your linear, if you have a data like this, right? Um, so the linear model is actually a reasonable model to fit this data, but it's not the best. The best model is this one. A piecewise linear model. Yeah, because in this model, you make no errors, right? But uh, we know that this model is going to fail uh, in the future because basically the, the point of developing a model is for you to, prediction model is to predict things that are coming in the future. If you fit the historical data too well, uh, then there's a danger that will come. Uh, assuming that the future data is more or less equal to the historical data, then your, if you overfit it, it's fine, right? Then, right, so, so future data is almost the same as your historical data. So in that case, our overfitting will not cause you any problems. In fact, it will actually give you very good performance. But in general, uh, we can expect that the future data will not be exactly the same as your historical data. So, and in fact, your, your data used in the training set may be actually biased, we don't know. So if you overtrain your model, right, uh, you, 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 you tune the model in such a way that it makes perfect prediction for your training set, you are going to get a lot of uh, problems with using it to predict uh, future, future samples, right? because you already overtune it, okay? So, so uh, when using neural network, it's, it's important to be uh, mindful of this, right? Don't overtune it, okay? Which means that you, you might need to kind of like just stop tuning it when you get results that are more or less reasonable, right? You don't have to optimize it until you get some like 99% accuracy or something like that, right? That, that's actually overfitting. You know that it's overfitting already. Okay, right, so this is uh, your neural network. So we'll look at 
it in more details later. This is just to give you the overview of these methods. Um, yeah, so I think those are just about the models that we're going to cover later. Um, so to recap, so we have geometry-based models, uh, geometric models. So this may be um, things like uh, regression, um, regression, and also let's say um, SVM, support vector machine. And then we have uh, probability based methods. So that will be um, logistic regression and um, naive base. And we have likelihood based methods. The kernel. Density estimation. So in R, this is quite easily done. There's a, I think it's, there's a package called KDE or something like that, kernel density estimation. Then you have the decision trees. Or sometimes known as classification and regression trees. Finally, you have uh, algorithmic methods, A and N. Okay, um, so those are the, the general outlines of the um, methods that we're going to look at later. In fact, um, let me see. Geometry based methods. I think you can include LDA here as well. Yeah, because uh, when you do LDA, so basically you can still have, let's say, your LD1, LD2. So if you manage to get some um, some some distribution like this. Well, actually, um, LDA, well, maybe LDA can go anywhere. It can maybe, let's say, can be also here. But since you are here, you can, you can build kernels of it. Or you can just uh, put a line through it, okay. All right, okay, so, um, so, okay, so I think uh, we're just about time, uh, 9.20. Um, do you have any questions? Or you, um, some of you have, probably worked with these methods before. So if you want to maybe share something, it's also fine. Uh, so actually I would like to ask some questions relevant to multi-class classification. Sorry, uh, about? The multi-class classification. All right. So uh, in general, right, we always get the imbalanced data set. Like even it's not a multi class, it's just a binary, also we will have yeah. balance. So that's why we couldn't actually uh predict them. I mean judging their performance based on the accuracy. Uh but we are using the so called what what is it? the confusion matrix or maybe the F1 score. So when it comes to this multi class, right, is it we are still using the mean per class error or there are some other evaluation method actually? 
Okay, for multi-class, um, you can still calculate things uh, like sensitivity and specificity, but uh, then you will have things like sensitivity for a particular class. Okay, yes. um, sensitivity for with respect to class one, sensitivity with respect respect to class two, and so on. Uh, so I guess you 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 can have separate uh, metrics for the different classes and um, and um, yeah well so you are, you're asking like what metric to use is it yeah because it's like um pretty hard to decide I mean, from what I can find is generally mean per class error so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, I think it it it's a bit hard to say which metric is the best. Um, I think the metrics they they there are some situations when they will not be very useful. Uh, like for example, things like accuracy, right? Um, may no longer be useful when you have, let's say, a very minority class. Uh, like in some kind of cases, let's say uh, like rare cases, like for example, you do fraud detection, you okay. generally will have a uh, majority of cases, maybe up to 98%, maybe all normal cases, because it's fraud, right? If you have massive fraud, then basically you, you're losing a lot of money already. So you, you don't have time to hire a data scientist to help you look at these things. So, so um, yeah, so in that case, let's say, you, when you get the data, you you have something like ninety eight percent of normal samples and maybe two percent of uh, abnormal samples. In this kind of situation, if you think about it, right? Uh, if in this kind of situation, if you're a naive person, you will basically just go by the majority class, right? Every time, just keep on predicting as normal case, and you will be yes. ninety eight percent correct all the time, isn't it? Yeah, you just predict all zero, it'll be like eight, Yeah, eight, so yeah. you're ninety eight percent accurate. Does that help you? Because there's no, no point, right? Your point is to catch the catch the fraud cases, right? Isn't it? Yes. It's because your whole idea of the classifier is to catch the fraud cases, not not to be accurate. By being accurate, yeah, you can be very accurate by just basically ignoring the data and guessing everything as normal. You'll be ninety eight percent accurate. That's quite impressive, right? But then, but then that's defeating the purpose. No, not, yeah, it's not not meaningful, is it? So in that kind of situation, you 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 actually may want to optimize for let's say whether your model is very sensitive. Um, uh, because if your model is sensitive, then it will catch all the fraud cases, right? Uh, but then uh, you have to balance it against your specificity so that you do not. Uh, in in the midst of catching, possible, yeah, in the midst of catching yeah. the fraud cases, you don't commit too many uh, false positives. Because you commit false positives, meaning that you are you are uh, flagging the normal cases as as fraud, right? Yep. So then you're disturb basically disturbing the customer. You see, so um, yeah, so in. It will depend on situations. In some situations, uh, it may be okay. In some situations, uh, you may have to think about which metric makes more sense. Uh, using things like a F1 score is, uh, the F1 score is like some kind of a harmonic mean of your sensitivity and something called yeah. positive. It's balance. Yeah. Positive it's balance between that. Um. Yeah, then it's a little bit kind of like an abstract thing because it's a harmonic mean, you see. <laughs> so it, it general the idea is only like uh well a larger the larger it is the better la. Um that's just the intuitive sense, but um uh I don't know, you if you read the literature they there are always uh, some criticisms about why these metrics don't work uh, under particular situations. So um so again, my my understanding will be those met the metrics you you learn them, but do not be too much attached to them. Uh, 
um, you use them as and when they are useful to you in, in according to the circumstances. Because I've seen people like uh, who are not careful with this, they they kind of like report um, they actually based wrote, on metrics. <laughs> they wrote papers and okay, fine. Uh, they wrote papers and then they, they reported the accuracy, right? To be very high, 98% or something. When I look at the data they are looking at, it's actually dealing with like rare cases. So then I look at the baseline case. The baseline is already very like... 90%, 99%. Yeah, so basically whatever they do, right? They, I think they are using the wrong, they are arguing using the wrong metric. Uh, they might have wanted to showcase more on the sensitivity, but then they reported, oh, my, my, my accuracy is 98%. Yeah, sure. Uh, without using that, your accuracy is 97%. So you just in, improve 1% by going through all that trouble. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah you spend like what, yeah. months or days to, to squeeze out 1% of accuracy out of that. Um, it, it's, I mean, like they probably have something. Uh, it's just that they don't know how to emphasize it, right? Um, yeah, I have some. Um, yeah, because if I have you, something to share about this, this uh, fraud. Uh, uh. When you say that uh, papers, right? Actually, in real life, if if we don't talk about credit card frauds that uh people will report that this is fraud, right? A lot of a lot majority of fraud is like the transaction kind of fraud. They are not they are not really labeled. Not labeled. And then, yeah. Yeah, they are not labeled. You you don't even have those labeled data in the first place. And then the secondly, is like um this from experience uh, at the end also didn't have success lah. But <laughs> but this the uh, difficulties that may be faced is that one is first is that no labor data and then second is the uh the the banks they have their own rules already in the first place one like the rule based detection and I'm then saying we, the rejection are, inference yeah, yeah. is it we like we we don't know you know we don't know yeah. what kind of um filters that they already have in the first place. I think the rule base is still the yep. um the first yeah, layer. Majority, that, yeah. uh, we have to know for that like a cash hole, cash trash CTR or the SDR, you know, suspicious uh, record those kind of things, right? Okay. And then, and then it was said that the the graph network can solve this kind of fraud problem, uh, But the graph network, if you really want to apply in banks, right? Their daily data, their daily transaction is like. Millions, message, millions already. Yeah. You know, you just spend time. You just spend time to like write the, learn the code to do the big data transformation already. Already die already. Then, <laughs> then. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand know, that. So the ETL itself is already a trouble. And then you don't even know. Building an algorithm. Yeah, you don't even know what it really looks like if it is real fraud. We. I mean the papers they, they write like all those are like they, they created the cases that it will look like this one. But then in real case when you use it, beta is so big and then you just simply query, you don't even know the patterns look like what. And then have to design the graph network yourself. But I I doubt uh, I doubt this kind of method. Um I don't know, I don't know how how we are going to uh, do fraud detection effectively or efficiently in real well, uh, hmm. I think it's same. Yeah. The like same goes to the credit scoring also because, in general, a uh, financial institution definitely have a rules before they passing anything, right? So after that, then they will only apply to your models and then looking at your models, the result of good, yes or no. So before that, already filtered by a a short a, a list of heuristic rules. Yeah. So yeah, in general. I read some yeah. paper, they, they, because some, some of the hackers, they know these rules, then they try to, like, if 10,000 is the trash, cash threshold, then they 999. Yes. Uh, so, yes. so, like, clustering, clustering is more suitable in this case, right? The clustering of those to the known frauds one, like, looks similar one. But, but still, the label data is very few near, really, really very few near. Uh. Yeah. yeah, sure. The, I think 0. The, something percent. Zero point something percent. You are talking about zero point something percent of the whole transaction detected. Oh. Mm. Yeah, because the There's labeling a, one, oh, of one million. Yeah, the Few, labeling I, takes mm. extra time, right? Um, you need expert to. It's a form of curation, isn't it? Labeling. 
Yeah, they, they really go and study the case when people reported. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, the so. de department, they, they are so headache. They like, <laughs> they very sad. Then they ask us, uh, can, can you all do it algorithmically or what? But it's not what like. Uh. But yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't finish it. I left already the company. <laughs> it sounds like it sounds some company that I know. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, sure. Like, uh, because the, I think a lot of people, they, because the label, the class label that is given is actually independent of the data. So it has to be, there's a cost involved in getting that label. Um, which, which uh, so, if, if you just keep on doing this thing without realizing this in practice, then um, yeah, like you said, you, you find that outside there, there are many unlabeled data, you see? Because who, who is the person, uh, this, first you have to hire this person to label the data. Then second thing, the problem is that if the volume, data volume is very big, like those transactions, right? Then who can label it, right? Because uh, the volume is yes. too big. And then, then yes. the only thing that is possible is you have some algorithm to label it. But then that means uh, trying to do unsupervised learning, right? Basically, yeah. you, you try to cluster things and then once you find clusters and then maybe you can characterize the cluster by the dominant um, behavior of the members inside there. Right? That may be possible, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, you may you see. I think they are using some sort of yeah, if positive the, unlabeled method. That's one for fraud detection part. If I'm not mistaken, uh, I mean it's like in general, definitely fraud is one of the problems that we we, we cannot know, and also the behavior itself change from from time to time. We we cannot. Uh, yeah. We, it's too hard for us to detect it instantly, especially when you don't have label data or even you have it and people will actually know what kind of rules that they can get on like even anti-money laundering like let's say you have a threshold of 1000 per transaction per day then they realize that this kind of threshold so they change it to 500 per transaction mm. so it's it's relatively hard to label in any sense uh, yeah. and sometimes when you hire someone to label so they they are like um, they reset. <laughs> yeah, they might even miss the label actually. So you, your sample itself also might not be. I mean, your label itself also might not able be to be useful to you in the end. Yeah. Actually, our country is all trying to do this. BNM actually also try. They actually come up with a tender to ask ask people to um, propose some fraud detection method uh, for their STR reports. Because a lot of banks submitted their STR reports, and then these STR reports will talk about uh they will describe uh, why why they think that this um this transaction is suspicious, and then they every day there's there are a lot of reports submitted to Bank Nagara, and then they look at it one by one. Then they will, they also trying to find how do they look at this STR easier. These are all quite I I, I don't know how we our data science can solve this yet uh. I'm not sure uh. Just sharing mm. yeah yeah so um so yeah so i think uh, just now um uh, you mentioned i think jake mentioned something about um the credit scoring right yeah you see the, the problem with credit scoring is this um the data that the banks have right they they basically don't come from a representative population uh, yes. like whether they default or don't default that kind of data that they have right they already come from people who they pre-selected like you said so so that's why uh, they are model right and then later they want to use that to to predict credit credit worthiness and this is already a problem because you are using um, a bias sample you are basically a bias sample to, to do that right and so it's not going to give you very good results. Actually, I think many years ago, like, I don't remember where, but I think I remember, recall like, um, there are people who said that the only way you can fix this problem for the banks 
is to, to accept everyone. You kind of like uh, basically just okay. You don't tell, but don't tell people. But uh, you just basically uh, when for during a period of time, anyone who comes into your loan department asking for a loan, you just give them the money. Okay. Uh, that means you're doing an experiment, but you're not telling them, lah. Yeah, yeah, so, I understand that. So basically, you are, of course, uh, some of these are going to fail, right? Uh, some of these people are going to fail their business and not be able bad loans and all that. Fine, but that's part of your. But you are getting a data that is actually more representative of the actual population than let's say you already filter at that level. So, so that the kind of uh, model that you build may be more valuable, lah. But uh, of course, since it involves losing money, who wants to do this, right? Who wants to approve this project? Yeah, impossible. <laughs> I mean, like it hurts your KPI also. You don't. Yeah, get it, it hurts the KPI of the person who is proposing this project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So being banks, bank, bank people, they are very conservative about profits, right? So no one is carrying out this experiment. That's why I say I uh, then okay then you do you keep on doing your credit scoring lah. Um, it will be just based on your bias sample. And of course, you can get any model out and at the end, surely you can develop a model, but um, I think the performance will not be very outstanding. Yeah. yeah, I heard there's a, if I'm not mistaken, the benchmark for credit scoring, I mean like default or not default, the AUC is about 0 0.65 to 0 0.75, if I'm not mistaken, in general. Yeah, well, so, and, and then uh, different countries, different behavior, you see? Yes, yes, to, different countries have different laws. Uh, you, you have to tune differently, you see? So there's no one size fit all model. You want the data collected also. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, so, so that that's something that we is useful to keep in mind when we discuss machine learning because uh, your 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 training sample has to be representative um, of whatever you are trying to predict in the future. Otherwise, um, it's not going to work very well. You will still get your model, but um, just don't hope that it will do very well on the unseen samples, right? Yep. Yep. It will, it will fail there actually, yeah. Uh, then we're causing a cost over there. Mm. Okay, so, okay, I think uh, that's a good discussion. So, thanks for taking part and sharing your experience. Uh, I think that's important because, uh, um, yeah, this is what it's about, right? Uh, to expand everyone's uh, um, experience about these things okay all right okay so i'm going to stop recording now um so thanks for sharing <laughs>